Welcome everybody to another episode of B2B Marketing Asia podcast. I'm your host for today, Sheila Berman. And today I have a very special guest, Pavel Bolowski, the Chief Product Officer and Co-Founder of Mero. Now, today we are going to be talking about customer data platform. For those who still can't wrap their heads around it, what is it and why is it important? It's a great question. There's definitely been a little bit of a hype, not AI hype, but like a little bit of hype in as far as MarTech goes in the last yeah. few years. Definitely fueled by Gartner pushing this out a little bit a couple of years ago. I think it's, you know, rather than puristic definition of what the customer data platform, or we call it CDP is, because we need more acronyms in this space for sure, is simply, I don't really care what are the different flavors, but I do care where it sits in the MarTech stack. To me, the, there is already enough busyness in the, the potential architecture that important to me, what does this kind of interface with and where is some friction. So for me, rather than giving you a definition of, of CDP, by the book, which is to connect and collect customer data from different touch points, which kind of sounds almost like every other marketing software, to be honest. Yes, um, exactly. it, the, my, my kind of take is that it's very much an evolution of two categories, DMP mm -hmm. and CRM. So DMP being something that would have historically been used for over anonymous data only. So when you really look at things through the lens of marketing funnel, that would be that would be more in a kind of the awareness stage where mm -hmm. you don't really know who you're talking to or you're trying to target someone. So it's all essentially cookie, typical third party cookie based advertising. And that category has been in decline and dying. A lot of vendors pulled out of that, but still the kind of the need for managing audiences doesn't really go away for enterprises. Yeah. And on the other hand side of the spectrum is CRM from my perspective, where CRM has been as I think in, and especially this podcast, I don't need to explain what CRM does, but more yes. in a B2B context, the CRM has been where we store customer data after mm -hmm. transaction has happened. The reality is customer has a few more nuances these days. We specifically look after and or look into something we call customer identity because we understand that when a customer uses multiple devices, multiple logins, non-logins into different apps and if into different interfaces, calls a call center, uh, talks to ch chatbots on AI powered support. That's all the, the kind of the different sources of data for a customer. And CRM historically would not really been designed to be very integrative, right? So for me, it's a convergence of these two categories and something as a next step in evolution of that. Great. You actually touched on integration, which I think is a, also a very important topic, but we'll leave that for another time. Now, how is that different? Because you already mentioned the CRM. So a lot of people are actually saying even Google Analytics is also tracking it, considering you're talking mm -hmm. about customer journey. So how is that going to be different then from the traditional CRM that we know about? Yeah, Google Analytics are definitely coming into mix. If you would ask me a few years ago, I would probably laugh because the, the old Google Analytics were more about measuring properties and pages. Right now, yes. GA went, I would, I would actually say that, that G, GA went our direction because we've been about measuring actions and events yes. since the very beginning. And this is obviously what GA4 involved into. So it's, it makes sense that that tool will also be playing part in this direct integration with CRM, this your entire kind of click stream. But it's still, I see where that comes becomes really limiting is whenever you start talking about some complexity in business, right? And not every single business is as simple as Grab App, right? And mm -hmm. even Grab App has 20 different businesses under under the hood, uh, but yeah, it has one interface. So it makes it a little bit simpler. But what we are talking to and the brands we are talking to is typically retailers with multiple brands. And you want to see how shoppers are overlapping between the different brands even before they buy, right? Even when it's just an anonymous, anonymous visitor. And if you don't have a smart identification of these users, long-term persistent, across devices, across domains, then it's a really narrow view that you will you will have. So yes, it's the direction. Reality under the hood is a lot more complex, but mm -hmm. it's a good direction. Yeah, I think that it's always good when a lot of these companies like Google, for example, starts to innovate. I think a lot of the complaints or criticisms against Facebook, Google, Meta, sorry, <laughs> is that they've stopped innovating. I, so in a way, I would say that they're going the right direction, although 
maybe you probably say that you were there first or your company was there first and you were at the beginning of the, the, the curve. Yeah. The, okay. the, the specialists always have different yes. roles in this, right? It's for anyone, even and Google, we don't really see them as a competitor in this space, not at all. It's very compatible, actually. But if you look at the big guys, the big tech, your Microsoft, and for, for them, it's product number what? 347? Mm -hmm. For us, it's product number one and only one. Yeah. So I think you have the different mindset when the vendor is a specialist, right? Yeah, exactly. This is not a tricky Bit. So whenever we have anything involving customer identification, because it, like you mentioned, DMP, it's all about anonymous data, but now we're tracking the customer behavior. We actually have an identity related to the customer. So this now goes into the whole data privacy issue. How does the CDP ensure that customer data don't get misused? Very well, actually, it's a great question. So I think that's one of the bigger problems with the EMPs historically have been that there's a lot of data trading without users mm. and without users really knowing about it. And that's the old reality is like you looked at a website, media website five years ago, and they would have 150 different trackers because they are trying to monetize every single possible unit as many times as they can. So it made sense. It's old school, it's, it, but it made sense then. And the privacy, I think the privacy has two aspects for me. One where it's about legality, where you, of mm -hmm. course, have to observe the, even company in Singapore has to observe a GDPR if they are serving users in Europe, right? Or same in Australia or same in Philippines. And all of kind of the Southeast Asian markets are now slowly rolling out, adopting various of, of GDPR, which are some necessarily constructed in the beginning, but as a take one, I'll take it, they will, they will work it out a little bit later. So there is this whole push into the legal aspect of it, but I think there's also the brand promise, if I call it that aspect of it, where brands simply need to have transparent relationships with their consumers and especially the new generation will really demand it because they are digitally savvy. They understand technology, not en masse, but they do more than the previous generation. So I think there's me there. And the CDPs do play a crucial role. I always use this metaphor where Google and Meta has been always called the the walled gardens, right? Mm -hmm. You you are allowed to come in and play, pay and play, but you don't take anything out except for your campaign stats. And thank you very much. So the walled garden, obviously, treasuring the data that's inside. So what we are saying to clients is that if you, when you adopt CDP correctly, you have this ambition to create your own walled garden. So you safeguard your consumer data, you put it in a place where you have control and transparency over it, but at the same time, you get to use it a lot. So I think that's the CDP is that kind of that vehicle. In the words, it's okay to process and manage identifiable PII data, and be, but we have to be very careful with it. We want to always keep it under our control. So that's where CDP comes in, I think. So I think going back to what you mentioned about there's the legislation aspect, but at the same time, it's also to the benefit of companies to then actually use this as their own branding, I, I would say how they would market themselves, right? Like we are very protective and we understand the, the desire of our customers or consumers or even our business partners to make sure that we protect their data. So if any company can actually say that, yes, we can guarantee privacy and no misuse of your data, that's actually something great for everyone to then follow. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Look, I almost think, and maybe that's a stretch in my kind of wild imagination, but I can almost consider this part of the ESG, right? Because the G in ESG stands for governance and every yes. brand is, every corporate brand is taking this super seriously. Now you have to take, you apply governance to your data and how do you process your relationship with your consumer? So it, it's, to me, it's absolutely part of that. So yeah, it's going to be more and more, more focus. Well, hopefully we do see more of that customer brands really taking care of the customer data. So now talking about the business organizations itself, how do we usually convince companies to use customer data platforms? Do you target a specific team like the marketing team, the sales team, mm -hmm. the legal team or the IT team? Because it comes into or it touches all the different aspects, right? Who are the most difficult to convince? 
True. I think uh, you just hit the nail on the head here. I think it's not so much about who is hardest to convince. It's about it's hard to co- coordinate all of those. And what we as a sales organization ourselves, what we are learning is that we need a simple entry into organization. Because mm-hmm. if you come into a big business and you start talking to them about customer data platform will take data from all of your sources, your CRM, your SAP, your websites, your digital apps, I don't know what else. It literally involves everyone except for maybe CFO. They will be signing the bill, but yes. yeah, yeah, everyone is a stakeholder suddenly. And that is impossible for, as far as like sales process goes, that is impossible to navigate. Sales cycles are very long for CDPs. So we're, we've been last couple of years really focusing on how do we simplify this? And maybe the simple, the simplified version is that we come in through a thing like a use case, right? Mm-hmm. Might be a personalization, might be a lead generation. So something that really just touches one department and you sneak it in, you give them the use case and you add one more and they are using CDP before they even know it, but they don't really have to do the whole charade of convincing eight people on board minus one level that they need the platform because everyone will have their own preferred vendor and it becomes a little bit of a fiasco as a process to manage. So it's, it's difficult to also. So would you say that having a really good use case would actually make convincing them half of the job done? So how do you pick the use case for you to use? Look, we've been in the market for about four or five years, right? And we've done something, there's a few things we've done we've done i think and importantly in 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 the space in time and there are things that we've learned and we haven't really done extremely well from the beginning but one of the things that i consider very important is now that we focused on vertical because i think with something such a generic concept like a cdp you could really apply to any business and i see that and i've seen i've been seeing that it's like everyone has some sort of customer so i guess it's applicable to them right whether you are b2b b2c b2b2c whatever whatever you are you can use it but that makes it really difficult to explain how specifically that technology will help to a certain business. So we've really narrowed down where we are good, uh, verticals that we have been successful in, which is basically three verticals. We are very good in banking and fine. we have some specific, say, technological predispositions that your usual software as a service where customer's data has to go to vendors cloud doesn't really cut it we are in a space where our technology often has to go to the client's data and clients infrastructure and servers whether it's in cloud or on premise so that's the one area where we focus so business and banking and financial services and we have learned what is repeatable in that industry and we are ready to take that horizontally almost so that's i think this what obviously in B2B sales would always help is a case study, right? So exactly. I think we were in a few years, in the first few years, we had to find a... Oh, lost you there a bit. Oh, I lost you for a bit there. Would you mind going back? Yeah, to yeah, yeah. Few... So we had to always find that kind of one foolish innovator who would who would adopt the CDP, make that investment, right? And then when we know this is something that is applicable across markets, because all companies in that space will be more or less similar, or will have similar use cases and challenges, then this is something that that's repeatable. So always in B two B, I think the case study always pushes it really hard. That's where you convince the people to do something. From my perspective, also. One of the things I have sold multiple software applications over over my previous kind of life before Mayra, and it's been always a bit of a struggle to put like a price tag and ROI on it, because if you are just doing analytics for content to understand what works better, it doesn't really make you money. But like we really are touching my kind of work with retailers where in their e-commerce space, we touch maybe 15, 20% of their revenue that goes through in terms of personalizing the customer experience on site of site, which is for commercial tool, that's very unusual to have that level of impact. So I think that's, that's the one differentiator where the tool should theoretically sell itself because it makes money. Exactly. And we also don't want to propagate the usual thinking that are uh, marketing, another marketing tool, marketing tech stack, and it's just a cost. But we don't yeah, really see, exactly. like you mentioned, like it's sometimes hard to quantify return on investment, but it's always good to actually have something because as one of the stakeholders, the CFO would probably look at it and go, was it worth investing? Okay. So going to one of the things now you may or you may not want to answer this depending on how you'd like to approach this, but what would you say would be the biggest challenge or lesson that you learned when you and your team we're building your own CDP. 
that it, picking one is really hard. And I think the the product side is actually not a challenge at all. It's easy. If you have resources, if you have smart people, you have a good product vision, I will say, and I know how this will probably drive a bunch of core product people really mad, but I'll say that product is easy. Product, You have intelligent people, you're not solving problems, you are sol- solving variation of a problem, so you are not really inventing anything entirely new in, the, in this category, right? It's all incremental improvement. Product is easy, technology is easy, business is really hard. And I think we haven't been focused enough on sales from the very start of the company. And if that's one thing I would, if I had the time machine, I would go back in time and do it a little bit differently. I think investing a little bit more of the organization into sales and more in a way of US-based startups and that culture. I think that's one thing I would probably think of changing, yeah. Good advice for all of those who are thinking of also developing product. Make sure that you have very good sales team because it's your sales teams who are going to be making sure that your company is profitable. Okay, last question. Was there an instance that really stood out for you when you were implementing CDP that crystallized how important this platform is for businesses? Yeah, look, I've, I've been obsessed with our clients and the fact that we have to make money for them. To me, that's look, they are, this is not an innovation play, right? This is, we are not a lab. We are a business machine. If they use us, they have to make money. So we've really focused on how do we prove this and how do we report on that as well? So you have had this full cycle of ingesting customer data, structuring it, segmenting it, describing the customer in a way that's useful to business, and then you activate on it, right? Whether this is personalization or whether this is direct marketing, like email push notifications, that has to be timely, has to be personalized with the right product, with the right service. So that's what that's what we've been focusing on. And now the kind of last mile of that is to close the loop and to report on that. And look, I have just recently We've done an analysis of kind of combining data from one vertical and what stood out. And I don't think, I don't think marketers really appreciate it enough because when you say to someone, a consumer, they literally imagine a person like you and me, right? Like if you, when you say a customer, you see an actual persona, the buyer persona. What they don't realize is how complex that is descriptively. So the digital twin, so to speak, mm-hmm. of that person is actually multiple facets, right? It's multiple devices. And look at this, the statistics like in, in markets like Indonesia, an average person owns 1.7 mobile phones, right? So how do you reconcile the different behavior that's coming from each of those devices. And can you even tell it's the same person? So I think this is something that your average kind of maturity level marketers are not really realizing just yet. But what we see and what we've come to is that when we split in retail, customers, customers base into two parts, a customer where we know just one device and customer where we know multiple devices, typically two, but sometimes more than that. You can think of combination of tablet and a mobile phone, desktop and a mobile phone, where in countries where that's the whole thing, and combination of devices like that. We realize that we have 50% higher customer lifetime value when we know that customer on multiple devices. And you would think it makes sense. It's a customer that probably buys more, therefore they use multiple devices. But it also comes to a point that when we looked at a sample period of time, we looked at the communication that goes out to that customer, combination of push notifications, emails, text messages, and stuff like that. We we realized that we are touching that customer with eight versus four personalized bits of message. And all of those personalized bits of message do contain some recommended product or some type of upsell per sell type of technique, right? So what I'm saying is that we realize that when we have a customer described better, they actually are more valuable to the company. And in this case, it's up to 50% uplift, which if you look at wow. a company with companies with cumulative like billion dollar revenue, that's not a little money. And when you then look at kind of the base itself, we realize that we learned this about 25% of those customers total, where we know them better. And these are altogether responsible for 35% of the revenue of their business. So this is something that the brands would typically not really see, but I think this is something that we need to evangelize and really explain that this matters because there's money in it, right? Yeah, that's very impressive. Those numbers definitely are. I think for any businesses who are very savvy and who are concerned about growing or increasing market share, that's a very good decision to actually invest on CDP. 
All right, everyone, that is all for today. It has been very exciting and a very educational session for me. I hope it has been for you as well. Thank you for watching and listening.